Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman. Uh, so I actually picked up this book because my girlfriend, Susie, uh, she's into Stoicism, so she kind of has been kind of teaching me the basics, and uh, I saw somebody on BookTube, I can't remember who, but I saw somebody talking about this, this book, and so I decided to pick it up as well. Uh, and at the same time, I just subscribed to a bunch of Stoicism YouTube channels, and uh, it turns out that one of them is the one uh, is the Daily Stoic, which is run by by uh, Ryan Holiday, who wrote this book. So yeah, uh, I'll see if we've got the blurb. Yeah, here we go. For over two thousand years, Stoicism has been the philosophy that attracts those who seek greatness, from athletes to politicians and everyone in between. And no wonder. Its embrace of self-mastery, virtue, and indifference to that which we cannot control has much to offer those grappling with the chaotic world. But who were the Stoics? This book vividly brings to life the men and women who shaped Stoicism and who strove to live by its timeless values. Each of the 26 figures in this book, from Seneca to Epictetus, Zeno to Marcus Aurelius, has a fascinating story and their struggles and successes offer valuable lessons for us today. Slave or empire, slave or emperor, famous or unknown, their lives show what it means to live well, and together their biographies provide a rich resource for anyone seeking serenity, self-direction, and a good life. So let's go and jump on ahead into some of the tabs. So I, I thought this was interesting. Uh, so we start with Zeno. Um, what's his, his name? <laughs> he was uh, Zeno the prophet from 334 BC to 262 BC. Uh, and there's this story where he sees a bookseller and we have, approaching the bookseller, Zeno asked the question that would change his life. Where can I find a man like that? That is, where can I find my own Socrates? Where can I find someone to study under as, Z as Xenophon had under that wise philosopher? Who can help me with my choice? If Zeno's misfortune had been to suffer that terrible shipwreck, his luck was more than made right for having walked into that bookshop and made doubly good when in that moment, Crates, a well-known Athenian philosopher, happened to be passing by. The bookseller simply extended his hand and pointed. And uh, yeah, the, the, the shipwreck thing is because he underwent a shipwreck and his family lost their shipment of purple dye, which was like worth its weight in gold back in the ancient times. And um, he, instead of seeing it as something that had ruined him, saw it as an opportunity because it's what led him to philosophy. So here we have uh, one of Crates' first lessons was intended to cure Zeno of his self-consciousness about his appearance. Sensing that his new pupil was too worried about his social status, Crates assigned him the task of carrying a heavy pot of lentil soup across town. Zeno tried to sneak the pot through town, taking back streets to avoid being seen doing such a humiliating task. Lentils were then seen as a food eaten only by poor people. Undoubtedly, Crates was attempting to challenge the snobbish identity of Zeno's upper-class upbringing. Tracking him down, Crates cracked the pot open with his staff, spilling the soup all over him. Zeno trembled with embarrassment and tried to flee. Why run away, my little Phoenician? Crates laughed. Nothing terrible has befallen you. Then we have how Zeno died, so... As with many philosophers, accounts of Zeno's death stretch our credulity, but teach a lesson nonetheless. At age 72, leaving the porch one day, he tripped and quite painfully broke his finger. Sprawled on the ground, he seems to have decided the incident was a sign and that his number was up. Punching the ground, he quoted a line from Timotheus, a musician and poet from the century before him. I come of my own accord. Why then call me? Then Zeno held his breath until he passed from this life. Nutter. Okay, so moving on to Cleanthes the Apostle from uh, born 330 BC and died 230 BC. So it says, some of the first attention he got was not positive. The satirical poet Timon of Phlaeus parodied him as a simpleton poring over lines of written text like a general reviewing his soldiers. Who is this, who like a ram ranges over the ranks of warriors, a masticator of words, the stone of Assos, a sluggish slab? In fact, Assos was famed for its rock quarries and its hard white stone that was used to fashion ancient coffins. When a satirist takes aim at you and finds only your love of language to criticise, it probably says something positive about your character. So it was for Cleanthes, quiet, sober, hard-working, one with his philosophy, and his money. And uh, I thought this was interesting. The Stoics are underrated for their wit. It was certainly a critical tool for Cleanthes, both in responding to criticism and in disarming those he needed to deliver it to. Speaking to a young man who could not seem to grasp his point, he said, Do you see? Yes, of course, replied the youth. Why then, Cleanthes asked, don't I see that you see? We have Cleanthes loved the challenge of poetry, believing that the fettering rules of the medium allowed him to reach people in a deep and moving way. He offered the analogy of the way that a trumpet focuses our breath into a brilliant sound. So we're going to move on to Aristo the Challenger, born 306 BC, died 240 BC. Didn't actually have too much to say about him, so then we have Chrysippus the Fighter, 
born 279 BC, died 206 BC. Runners in a race ought to compete and strive to win as hard as they can, Chrysippus was later saying. But by no means should they trip their competitors or give them a shove. So too in life. It is not wrong to seek after the things useful in life, but to do so while depriving someone else is not just. There was a saying popular in his time that if the gods were to take up the science of argument, they would use Chrysippus as their model. Uh, and the writers say there is no better definition of a Stoic, to have but not want, to enjoy without needing. So we're going to move on to Zeno the Maintainer, born unknown, died between 190 and 180 BC. His uh, paragraph, his, his chapter was quite short, so we'll move on from there. Diogenes the Diplomat, born 230 BC, died 142 BC. So uh, this is, it says, this Diogenes, unlike the famous Diogenes the Cynic, some two centuries before, did not sleep in a barrel. He did not masturbate in public. And funnily enough, when I first started uh, talking to Susie about um, uh, Stoicism, I remembered Diogenes and I thought he was a Stoic, but he's not, he's a Cynic. I do want to read about uh, Cynicism at some point too. It says, unfortunately, little to none of Diogenes' writing survives to us. A sad fact, given that he was, at least according to the texts that have been discovered entombed in the town destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, one of the most cited authors in the ancient world, even more than Plato and Aristotle. So that brings us on to Antipater the Ethicist, born unknown, died 129 BC, and I think uh, I thought this was a really interesting um, sort of metaphor. Antipater was the major force in moving the Stoics in this common sense direction. He loosened the absolution of being either all virtuous or vicious. He stopped minimising the indifferent things of daily life, whom we marry, how we dress, what we eat, and brought ethics to the forefront of the philosopher's concern, so that philosophy could be a productive life practice, a guide to living an operating system. So here we have uh, Panaetius, the connector, uh, born 185 BC, died 109 BC. And I just thought this is uh, quite a good little list, I suppose, bulleted list to read out. Panaetius argues that if we are to live an ethical life and choose appropriate actions, we must find a way to balance, one, the rules and duties common to us all as human beings, two, the roles and duties unique to our individual daemon or personal genius slash calling, Three, the roles and duties assigned to us by the chance of our social station, family and profession. And four, the roles and duties that arise from decisions and commitments we have made. So this is interesting because we can apply this to, the, to today. It's a populist irony. The strong man comes to power by making impossible and destructive promises to the disenfranchised. Do they actually have any intention of helping these people? Of course not. In fact, they'll actively stymie any reforms that will ma actually make the system more fair. All that matters is their iron grip on their ignorant base and the power that comes from it. So I just thought this intro was funny. Uh, Diotemus the Vicious, born unknown, died unknown, maybe 100 BC, origin unknown. He's mostly known for writing uh, slander basically and being an example of what not to do. And uh, the authors say, this is the mistake we make. We fight fire with fire and end up burning ourselves. Nobody remembers who started it and our scars stay forever if we even manage to survive the conflagration. When we are angry, it's almost always better to wait and do nothing. And as far as our enemies go, if possible, we ought to let them destroy themselves. So here we have uh, Cicero, the fellow traveller, born 106 BC, died 43 BC. So I thought this was interesting. Uh, his family name derived from the Latin word for chickpea, Cicer, which suggests they had, like Zeno's family, once been involved in trade. And it says, just as Zeno's incident with the lentils is loaded with class implications, so too is Cicero's association with the lowly chickpea. I love chickpeas. Hummus. If you have a garden and a library, Cicero would write in a letter to a friend as they discussed Chrysippus and Diodotus, you have everything you need. And uh, I'm just going to read this whole chunk out here. Uh, Unlike Cicero, Brutus wasn't just dabbling. Like Cato, like a real philosopher, he was prepared to risk everything to save the country he loved. He was going to assassinate Julius Caesar, now the dictator of the Republic Cicero and Brutus had loved. When Brutus and Cassius and the other conspirators hatched their plot to kill Caesar, however, they left Cicero out of the loop. They believed he was too nervous, too untrustworthy, too likely to second-guess the plot or undermine it, unintentionally or not. In short, when the moment counted, Cicero couldn't be counted on. He wasn't stoic enough. Shakespeare renders it this way. Cassius. But what of Cicero? Should we sound him? I think he will stand very strong with us. Brutus. Oh, name him not. Let us not break with him, for he will never follow anything that other men begin. How he, how he came about his ending. Now, when it counted, there was nothing in him, nothing in his fair weather personal philosophy that could have helped him stand up in this moment where cruel fate was bearing down on him. He could not rely on the inner citadel that countless Stoics had when they faced death, because he had not built it when he had the chance. All Cicero could do was hope for mercy. 
It did not come. Exhausted, like an animal that's been chased, he gave up the fight and waited for the killing blow. The assassins caught up with him on a road between Naples and Rome. He was beheaded, his head, hands and tongue soon impaled on display at the Forum at Mark Antony's house. Cicero is dead. That's how Shakespeare rendered the sudden fall of this great man. It was abrupt, violent and final. One of Caesar's soldiers, Gaius Asinius Polio, would write one of the most insightful epitaphs for Cicero. Would that he had been able to endure prosperity with more self-control and adversity with more fortitude. He invited enmity with greater spirit than he fought it. Indeed. So here we have Cato the Younger, Rome's Iron Man, born 95 BC, died 46 BC. So uh, I begin to speak, Cato once explained, only when I'm certain what I'll say isn't better left unsaid. If only we, we all did that, I suppose. So it says, even when Cicero aligned with Cato, there was this, a distinction, for there was never a sense that Cato was benefiting from these reforms, or that he was quietly accumulating his own wealth through them. In fact, despite his public positions and his wealthy family, Cato often looked like he had no money at all. He rejected the extravagant, brilliantly coloured purple robes that were fashionable in the Senate, and wore only a plain, ordinary dark robe. He never put on perfume. He walked Rome's streets barefoot and wore nothing underneath his toga. While his friends rode horses, he declined and enjoyed walking alongside them. He never left Rome while the Senate was in session. He threw no lavish parties and declined to gorge himself at feasts, and was strict about reserving the choicest portions for others. He lent his friends money without interest. He declined armed guards or an entourage, and in the army he slept in the trenches with his troops. It says when Caesar became consul, he would imprison Cato so as not to hear his marathon ramblings and so that the business of the state could resume. Imagine having to be in prison because you talk so much. So I think this is an interesting story. Um, he was a selfless soldier too. Pompey placed him in command of the military fleet, a massive armada of more than 500 ships. But quickly, Pompey, thinking about the political situation after the war, reconsidered giving his former enemy so much power. Within days of Cato's appointment, Pompey revoked it. Yet Cato remained undaunted. Without a hint of bitterness, Plutarch tells us, he handed the command over. Indeed, on the eve of the next great battle, it was Cato, so recently demoted and betrayed, who stepped up to inspire Rome's troops in defence of their homeland. As Cato spoke of freedom and virtue and death and flame, Plutarch tells us, there was such a shouting and so great a stir among the soldiers thus aroused that all the commanders were full of hope as they hastened to confront the peril. A stoic does the job that needs to be done. They don't care about credit. So here under, the, under Cato the Younger Rome's Iron Man, born 9546 BC, so this is how Cato died. Um, in his chamber, Cato sat down with a dialogue of Socrates and read it leisurely. Then he called for his sword, which he noticed had been removed from his room, likely by a friend hoping to forestall what could not be forestalled. It was time. His son, knowing what his father wanted to do, sobbed, begging him to fight on, to live. Apollonides the Stoic was begged to convince Cato of the philosophical reasons against suicide, but words failed him, only tears came. Restored to his sword, Cato checked its razor edge with his finger. Now I am my own master, he said, and then sat back down to read his book once more from cover to cover. He awoke sometime in the early morning after dozing. Alone and ready, he thrust his sword into his breast. It was not quite a mortal blow, but Roman steel had pierced Rome's Iron Man. Still, he could not go quietly into that good night. Writhing, Cato fell, awakening his weeping and mourning friends as he raged against the dying of the light. A doctor rushed in and attempted to sew the wound shut while Cato drifted in and out of consciousness. In his final moments, Cato came to, and with a fierce and almost inhuman determination he had first exhibited as a young boy, he died at 49 years old, pulling his own wound open so that life could escape him more quickly. And uh, so I quite like the way that this chapter ends on Cato as well. It says, You will not find many statues of Cato in Rome, or many books about him. For some reason, the honours go to the conquering generals and the tyrants instead. His great-grandfather had once said that it was better to have people ask why there wasn't a statue in your honour than why there was. In the case of Cato the Younger, it's even simpler. His character was the monument. His commitments to justice and liberty and courage and virtue were the pillars of the temple that stands to this day. He was a living statue in his own time, Rome's last citizen and Rome's Iron Man. And, now as then, on these pages and in memory, his finger points directly at us. So on to Portia Cato, the Iron Woman, died 70 BC, no sorry, born 70 BC, died 43 or 42 BC. And I'm just going to read the first three paragraphs of this chapter. 
It could be said that the conspicuous lack of credit given to women in the history of Stoicism is actually proof of their philosophical bona fides. Who better illustrates these virtues of endurance and courage, selflessness and duty, than the generations of anonymous wives and mothers and daughters of Greece and Rome who suffered, who resisted tyranny, who lived through wars, who raised families, and who were born and died without ever being recognised for their quiet heroism. Think of what they put up with, think of the indignities they tolerated, and think of the sacrifices they were willing to make. But that's sort of the problem. We don't think about that. We think about Cato and his great-grandfather. We don't think about his mother or his wife. The, the biographer Robert Caro, writing thousands of years after the fall of the Roman Empire about the rise of the American Empire, observed just what this unconscious bias misses. You hear a lot about gunfights and westerns, he said, of the history of the frontier. You don't hear so much about hauling up the water after a perennial tear. So this, all about Portia here, um, so she married Brutus. As a knowing wife, she quickly intuited that Brutus was planning something in 44 BC, although what she wasn't sure. Instead of demanding that he explain himself, Portia decided she would prove her trustworthiness to her husband and fortitude to herself, though one would think that her family tree was sufficient. Plutarch tells us that Portia took a small knife and stabbed herself in the thigh, and then waited to see how long she could stand the pain. Bleeding profusely and shaking in near delirium from the wound, when Brutus finally came home, she grabbed him and said, Brutus, I am Caro's daughter, and I was brought into thy house, not like a mere concubine, to share thy bed and board merely, but to be a partner in thy joys, and a partner in thy troubles. Thou, indeed, art faultless as a husband, but how can I show thee any grateful service, if I am to share neither thy suffering, secret suffering, nor the anxiety which craves a loyal confidant? I know that woman's nature is thought too weak to endure a secret, but good rearing and excellent companionship go far towards strengthening the character, and it is my happy lot to be both the daughter of Cato and the wife of Brutus. Before this I put less confidence in these advantages, but now I know that I am superior even to pain. Shakespeare renders the same scene quite beautifully as well. Tell me your counsels, I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound, here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience, and not my husband's secrets? Basically, she was batshit crazy. Okay, so here we have Agrippinus the Different, born unknown, died after 67 AD. And um, I love this, because there's a mention of Alice in Chains. But to Agrippinus, even having lost his father under such circumstances, this kind of compromise was inconceivable. I want to be the red, he said. That small and brilliant portion which causes the rest to appear comely and beautiful. Be like the majority of people, and if I do that, how shall I any longer be the red? Years later there would be a song by Alice in Change, which would say in a nutshell what Agrippinus believed in his heart. If I can't be my own, I'd feel better dead. I like how they wrote that as well, because the song is called Nutshell. And they, the writers here, they say, Yes, the beauty of the garment is made by the threads that stand out, but it's equally true that the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Here we have Seneca the Striver, born 4 BC, died 65 AD. And this confused me because it says, Unlike Jesus, who was born the same year as Seneca, in an equally far-flung province of the Roman Empire, there was little meekness or humility in Seneca. So you're telling me that Jesus was born 4 BC? Jesus Christ was for, born four years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Something does not add up. It says, uh, most interestingly, he quibbled with the idea that death was something that lay ahead of us in the uncertain future. This is our big mistake, Seneca wrote, to think we look forward toward death. Most of death is already gone. Whatever time has passed is owned by death. That was what he realized, that we are dying every day and no day once dead can be revived. And uh, here they say, it's the old lesson. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You control what you do and say, not whether people listen. And uh, he was also, he wrote plays as well, and, and we've got, In the Middle Ages, it was thought that Seneca the Tragedian was an entirely separate figure from Seneca the Philosopher. James Rom marvels at Seneca's range. It is as though Emerson had taken time off from writing his essays to compose the opera Faust. This is incomplete. It's as if Emerson founded Transcendent, wrote Faust, and served as Lincoln's vice president. This tickled me as well. <laughs> Seneca would again find that philosophy did not exist only in the ethereal world or only on the pages of his writings. Tacitus tells us that Nero's first attempt to kill Seneca, again by poison, was spoiled by Seneca's meagre diet. It was hard to kill someone who had so turned away from their former life of opulence that he was eating mostly wild fruits and water from a burbling stream. But even this reprieve was short-lived. And then he eventually tried to commit suicide and we have, for Seneca, death did not come as easily as he would have hoped. His meagre diet seemed to have slowed his blood flow. So, next, 
He willingly drank a poison he had kept for precisely this moment, but not before pouring a small libation to the gods. So I want to move on here to Epictetus, born 55 AD, died 135 AD. He was Epictetus the free man. So um, we, we have Epictetus was born the son of a slave woman in, in what is now modern Turkey, in a region that as part of the Roman Empire was subject to its brutal laws. One of those laws, Lex Aelia Sentia, made it impossible for slaves to be freed before their 30th birthday. So it says, even by Roman standards, Epictetus had a cruel master. Later, Christian writers portray Epictetus' master as violent and depraved, at one point twisting Epictetus' leg with all his might. As a punishment? As a sick pleasure? Trying to get a disobedient young kid to follow instructions? We don't know. All we hear is that Epictetus calmly warned him about taking it too far. When the leg snapped, Epictetus made no sound and cried no tears. He only smiled, looked at his master and said, Didn't I warn you? So here's a quote from Epictetus that's in a stoic um, like uh, meditation audio track that uh, Susie and I listen to. If a person wants to be happy, wants to be fairly treated, wants to be rich, according to Epictetus, they don't need life to be easy, people to be nice, and money to flow freely. They need to look at the world right. It's not things that upset us, he would say. It's our judgement about them. So here we have Epictetus the free man. Uh, born 55 AD, died 135 AD. So I thought this was interesting. Um, just as it was in 1965, as Colonel James Stockdale was shot down over Vietnam, knowing his, knowing he would almost certainly be taken prisoner, he would arm himself with Epictetus' teachings, which he had studied as a student at Stanford, and say to himself when he par parachuted down, I am leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. The authors say, forget everything but action. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Don't, it fl don't explain your philosophy, Epictetus said. Embody it. So here we have Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king, born 121 AD, died 180 AD. So he, li he lived during the period of the Antonine Plague, a global pandemic that originated in the Far East spread mercilessly across borders and claimed the lives of at least 5 million people over 15 years. He lost 8 of his children at young ages as well. Uh, he had a lot of children as you can tell. Uh, and it says, yet somehow we have Marcus Aurelius' writing after all these twists of fate. A, notice that a note that captures the essence of leadership and the incredible resilience of the human spirit. It's unfortunate that this had happened. No. It's fortunate that this has happened and I've remained unharmed by it, not shattered by the present or frightened of the future. It could have happened to anyone, but not everyone could have remained unharmed by it. Which I think is a good way of looking at things. We hope these pages contribute to the unbroken chain of influence that these Stoics' lives have had, an influence that remains active to this day. Indeed, one of the most difficult choices made here was the decision not to profile any so-called modern Stoics, who are continuing to wrestle with, practice, and exemplify Stoic principles in their own lives. Whether that's media titan Ariana Huffington, who carries a laminated note card of a Marcus Aurelius quote in her purse at all times, or General James Mattis, who has carried Marcus Aurelius's meditations with him on military campaigns for decades, Stoicism is alive and well in the modern world, with all the same brilliance, boldness and humanness. There are writers like Tim Ferriss, who have helped to popularise Stoicism to millions, and Laura Kennedy, whose thoughtful coping column runs in the Irish Times, and Donald Robertson, who specialises in the treatment of anxiety and the use of cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT. Chrysippus had, been an elite, uh, Chrysippus had been an elite athlete and a Stoic, while today's Stoicism is a daily practice for stars in the NFL, the NBA, MLB, World Cup rugby and soccer. Michelle Tafoya of Saturday... Michelle Tafoya of Sunday Night Football is an active student of the philosophy, which would make Musonius Rufus smile. On the wall of the clubhouse of the Pittsburgh Pirates is a quote from Epictetus, It's not things that upset us, it's our judgement about things. Zeno and Seneca and Cato and Cicero were Stoics who oversaw enormous fortunes and large business ventures, just as today's Silicon Valley entrepreneurs like Kevin Rose and Wall Street billionaires like Thomas Kaplan maintain their own Stoic practices alongside their businesses. Right now in Washington DC, there are senators who get together each morning in the Capitol building and discuss Stoicism, just as their counterparts did in Rome thousands of years ago, and the Founding Fathers did in 1776. May the spirit of Helvidius Priscus grow in that chamber. As was true in the ancient world, there are also countless other Stoics with less glamorous occupations, who nevertheless experience trials and tribulations that they endure thanks to the wisdom these philosophers help discover. They are parents, they are citizens, they are teachers. 
They are mortals with the same desires and fears, hopes and dreams as anyone who has ever lived. So overall, as you can probably tell from the fairly long review, I did enjoy reading this. I would give it probably a 4.5 out of 5. My only complaint was that towards the end it did start to drag a little bit for me. But uh, I would recommend it if you're interested in learning more about Stoicism, philosophy or just history in general. So there you have it, that's what I made of The Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments.